169, page 169, Power in the Blood, page 169, standing as we say. shed blood for us and the fact Lord that you freely offer it to us if we'll simply trust you by faith we pray Lord your word would do its work in each heart and life tonight according to your will and bless our time together as your church family we pray these things in Jesus name amen please remain standing and turn over to page 74 page 74 singing I go page 74 
special tonight in a few moments is going to be our uh, theme uh, chorus for this uh, revival week. It's on the back of the bulletin. So if you don't have a bulletin, we want to get you one of those now before I go through our announcements. All right. So if you need one, gentlemen, there are some down front here. Do we have anybody that needs a bulletin or you got one handy? All right. We do. So a couple of you ushers can come down here and pass those to the raised hands. That will be wonderful. And Brother Grant's going to teach us that song here momentarily, or at least get us a head start on it before our uh, revival begins uh, next uh, next Sunday, week from, week from today. And then also, uh, ladies, rem let me remind you, I'm going to be asking you about ladies' conference here in just a few moments as well. Uh, but we do want to uh, encourage everyone to be faithful here for our revival uh, uh, meeting with the Tozers. We look forward to getting reacquainted uh, with them, of course, I think since they were here last, they've married off a daughter. They've got another one that's uh, about to take a, a job, but uh, she's going to be with us. We're one of their last meetings. Uh, it's Heather's their favorite middle child, right? Yes, Heather will be with them. And so we look forward to uh, getting reacquainted with the Tozier family uh, there for just a few days. It'll be Sunday through, through uh, Wednesday of next week. A reminder that our teen and adult Sunday school classes will be here in the main auditorium at 10 o'clock. And then of course, our policy is no food or drink here in the auditorium, so if, if you uh, got to have your, your Bethel coffee before Sunday school, get here early so you're uh, good to go. And you won't want to miss Sunday school. It's always a blessing and a challenge, and I'm sure that uh, you'll benefit uh, by being here for Sunday school next week. So I hope that you'll plan to be here for every uh, part of the meeting that you can be. We also have a need for some nursery help on Monday and Tuesday night. Of course, Sunday and Wednesday are already covered. But we'll need some help with, in the nursery there. So if you're uh, able to help with that, uh, you can see Kara Lee tonight uh, right after the service. And if you'll wave at me, Kara Lee, I'll try to remind everybody of that again at the end of the service tonight, okay? So uh, be, uh, be mindful of that if, if you would. And, and again, we praise the Lord that we're able to get, a, get another van and get that back into, into service. Uh, one of our van routes today had 12 on it. So we praise Amen. the Lord for that. Amen. I don't know what the numbers were for the other routes, but uh, we're grateful for those that are that we're able to uh, minister to through through that ministry. There are revival flyers uh, in your bulletin, so I hope you'll take one of those, put it someplace prominent in your house so that you'll be thinking of it or keep it in a place with your prayer list so you'll be praying about the revival meeting uh, that will begin a, a week from uh, tonight. And then teens, remember that this Saturday, April the 17th, uh, from 1 to 4, you have a, a mini golf outing. You're going to Magic Castle uh, over in, uh, not Magic Kingdom, but Magic Castle over in Kettering. Uh, the cost uh, for the golf is at nine dollars, but they'll meet here Saturday at one o'clock and you can pick them back up at four. They'll be riding the bus over to over to uh, the mini golf uh, spot there. All right, the ladies conference over in Indianapolis is a favorite uh, event for our church and has been for many years. Of course, last year it was canceled like most everything was canceled last year due to uh, COVID. Uh, so they have, they're still gonna host it. Uh, that is the plan. At present, uh, and it will be Friday and Saturday, the first Friday and Saturday in August. And uh, we want, we need to determine uh, what the interest level is in our, our going. Let me explain, uh, ladies, a little bit about some of the adjustments that we know are going to be made. Uh, one, they are thinning down. They're, they've really scaled back the number of attendees they're going to allow. I know in years past they've, you know, squeezed people in, uh, you know, uh, anywhere they could and had a good good number of uh, ladies in attendance there for the conference, but they're going, going to trim that down so that will be will allow for some social distancing. I think generally the concept is that it would be by group, uh, so uh, there obviously won't be enough space to social distance. And you know, our church, for example, will be together in a group there, uh, so there will be some of that. Uh, they're trying to accommodate as best they can. Also, there will only be two workshops. You know, normally there are a multitude of workshops you can choose from. It's going to be more of a general session uh, uh, type conference, more like what a revival meeting here would be. There might be a, they may have they'll have a you know, two main rooms or something like that for the the workshop. So uh, they're still trying to do it, and I'm grateful for that. But wanted to give you ladies a heads up to what the expectations are. I don't want we don't want you to think that it's going to be just like it has always been. Uh, you can look at that one of two ways, I guess. Uh, they're doing their part to try to be helpful here and, and uh, mitigate, uh, still mitigating risk of COVID. I certainly thought it would be far behind us by now, but we're still trying, still dealing with uh, some of these things. So 
With all of that said, I need, I'm going to ask uh, you to raise your hand for one of two, uh, two places here. If, 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 if you're saying, you know, unless I'm providentially hindered, I'm going to go, all right? That'll be one category. I'll ask you to raise your hand here in just a moment. So that would be one option. If, if we're going, I'm going. That would be your, your spirit unless uh, something else, uh, can, you know, serious happened there. You wouldn't be able to go. And then two, if you say, I'm not real sure if, if uh, I can go, but I am interested in going. All right. So those are kind of the two groups that we need to find out. So first of all, if you would say, uh, unless I'm providentially hindered in some way, I plan to go. If that is you, you'd raise your hand, hold your hand up so we can get a count. <coughs> You make 12. All right. Okay. So you can put your hands down and don't raise them again for this question. If you say, I'm not sure, but I'm interested in going. You didn't raise your hand the first time, but you're interested in going. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six. I miss anybody else over here? Seven. All right. So seven more for that. Okay. All right. We'll, uh, we'll let you know the decision here. I think we have to make a, make a, uh, a sign up sheet and some of those things within the next few weeks here. So, it's coming on us, but thank you for thinking about that and for your uh, willingness willingness to participate there. All right, I think that's plenty of announcements. Other than, please continue to pray about our building, and I uh, do have two uh, at one important meeting tomorrow, and if that goes well, we'll have a follow up on Wednesday. So continue to pray about that. I'm grateful for the way the Lord's uh, leading. Uh, he's teaching all of us patience through this, and that begins with your pastor. So. Uh, thankful for the Lord's working and we'll trust his timing and follow his leading. All right, we'll have our ushers come. We'll receive our offering tonight. John, you want to lead us in prayer tonight? Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come to church. Uh, we pray that the uh, revival coming up soon will go well and we thank you for our pastors and we pray that you give Pastor Matt the words to speak. Speak tonight and touch our hearts in God's good talking in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take the back of those. We're going to have you seated right now. We'll, keep it, we'll have you stand up for maybe the final verse or something. So what we'll do is there'll be six beats that you'll hear the piano play. All right, learning this at six beats, and then we'll have you come in. All right, so go ahead and sing out. We're going to sing this during uh, revival <coughs> services and everything for this month and everything various times. All right, so let's go ahead and give it a try. Six beats, and go ahead, choir, sing it out. You guys know it. All right, help us out here. Help all the congregation 
everything else. Have fun with this. And, and the main thing is I tell the choir, whenever they're singing, you know, a lot of times, whether you make a mistake or something like that, that's one thing. But if you really think about the meaning, okay, of the song and what's yeah. in it, think about the words. Yeah. Don't worry about the mistake because people will see that testimony. Think as if you're being a testimony, a blessing to someone, right? That's the point of what the choir is trying to do. Not necessarily sing to someone else, but singing to be a blessing. So get that message out. Take heed, take heart to that message. And that helps me. I hope that helps you then as well. All right, six beats and we are in. Here we go. and we're in. mentioned this before, but as we get to uh, Revelation 17 and 18, uh, you wouldn't be able to follow them in the chronology. In other words, they're, they're not in order. The Holy Spirit's backing up and detailing some things that have, have already happened. And so as we study the book of Revelation, I hope that you could, at least in your mind as you read the book, you would you know the outline of the book. It'll help you uh, as you read it. And, and uh, chapter one, chapters one through three would be uh, our time, the, the, the age of grace, the time of the local church. Then chapter four begins with the rapture of the church and the judgment seat of Christ where God's people are in heaven and we're, we're before the Lord, uh, not being judged whether we enter or don't enter, we're being judged by what we did uh, with the Word of God, with the blessedness of the Holy Spirit in our lives after we were saved, how we lived after we trusted Christ. And we'll be so rewarded, or uh, as, as the Bible says in Corinthians, some shall suffer loss. And that doesn't mean the loss of their soul, it means that they, they won't uh, receive the, the great blessings that really Christ desires to give us. And in chapter 
uh, basically chapter 5, we begin with the, uh, the judgments uh, on this present world, chapter 5 through chapter 16. And chapter 16 really comes to the Battle of Armageddon. And then you get to chapter 17, and, and uh, really, uh, Babylon uh, is, if, if you read the scriptures, Babylon's already, already fallen. Uh, but you get to chapter uh, 17 and 18, and we get, we're dealing with religious Babylon, uh, which is, uh, which is the, the false religion uh, of the time and its power and how, how, it's, how it's identified and it's going to be severely judged and uh, really used by the Antichrist there in chapter 17. And then we come to chapter 18. Again, uh, Babylon's already been judged in our chronology, but the Spirit of God is detailing that judgment. He's showing us what happened. Then we get to chapter 19. If you put chapter, I hope you're following me, chapter 16 and chapter 19 together, you'll have the chronology. In other words, you have the battle of Armageddon, the coming of Christ, and then you'll see the saints in heaven in chapter 19. Okay, so chapter 17 and 18 are just detailing the fall of Babylon. Everybody follow me? Okay. So as we come to chapter 18, we're seeing the details and uh, we're going to see some truths here that I, I think will be helpful to us. The title of the message is No More at All. And uh, if you're able uh, to stand, uh, uh, if you'd stand in honor of the scriptures, we're going to read the first three verses of chapter number 18. <clears throat> and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, And the earth was lighted with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Our Heavenly Father, I pray you give us understanding and application to our lives and our time as we, as we consider this passage of Scripture. Lord, so many are deceived, even in our time in this present age, by, uh, by things that don't really uh, give them the desires of, the, of their heart or the the blessedness which you would like to provide for them. Uh, and Lord, I pray we'd be able to point that out tonight. If there's someone here without Christ as his or her Savior, uh, may they see the need and may they be convicted of their sin and sinfulness before thee. And may they turn and repent and turn to you tonight. For those of us who know you, Lord, may we be strengthened through the word of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In chapter 17, we saw the details of the judgment of false religion. In chapter 18, as we're looking at tonight, we're going to see the details and judgment of, of the evil of what, what is called Babylon or uh, social, political, and commerce that's built upon man. It's built upon the exclusion of Jesus Christ, the exclusion of the Savior, the exclusion of God. In other words, it's man's work. That's what the Tower of Babel was. It was man's work. Let us build a tower. We can reach heaven. In other words, we can do anything God can do. We, we've got this. And you, you can see this in our present age. Uh, man is, uh, uh, he thinks that he can do anything. We can cure a disease, we can, but we're so frail, it's ridiculous. We can't stop a germ. Men. Do, do I mean we shouldn't do things to protect ourselves? That's not what I mean at all. I'm, I'm saying that we're frail. 
It doesn't take much to stop us. Uh, we, uh, we're, we're God's creation, and uh, we're under the curse of sin, and, and we, we need the deliverance of Jesus Christ. Uh, science is being uh, falsely uh, propagated, science that doesn't work, science that isn't scientific. It's not based on truth. It's wrong. Uh, and yet people are living their lives in such a way that these things that aren't true are true. Because they don't know the Lord. Here in chapter 18, we see that judgment upon social and political and, and the commerce of the world that's all built upon man who's deceived ultimately by Satan. Now, I'm not blaming Satan and saying he's the reason people don't trust Christ. Uh, that's too easy. We have an opportunity, the Spirit of God, to work in our hearts to trust Christ. People are deceived because they reject Christ, and that's what the Bible teaches. Uh, we have an opportunity to be saved. But there, <clears throat> there are those that believe, in chapter 18, that believe that Babylon, the city, will, will be rebuilt in the last days. Now, I don't believe that. You can believe that if you want to. You won't, I, we won't fight about it. It's okay with me if you want to believe that. I believe that Babylon talked about here is the system of living without God. And people join that system. They become a part of that system because it's attractive uh, to, uh, to uh, us uh, in the absence of the Lord. Uh, this is living contrary to God. Let me, let me explain a little bit. Maybe this will make it a little more understandable. The believer is born again with, a, with certain desires. Now, after you're saved, you surely are not a perfect person. We still sin. We still have an old nature. We still disappoint God. We still disappoint ourselves. We still disappoint our family uh, to, to some degree. Uh, but the believer has a desire to be holy. We all want to be right with the Lord. We want to be holy. We want to be separated unto God. There's a desire there. Let me read for you a passage from Ephesians. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 4. According he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. And by the way, some people struggle with that and say, well, they're chosen. God knows he's going to be saved. That's talking about he's chosen us in Christ. There's a difference. Uh, and God, before the foundation of the world, God ordained that Jesus Christ would come to save the world. And the pastor made a point this morning, whosoever will, uh, let him call upon the name of the Lord. But let me back up. According has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That we should be holy. We have a desire to be holy. I mean, it's there. Uh, it, it, it comes with salvation. We are positionally uh, separated to God, but, uh, and we have a desire to be morally holy. That's the child of God. Secondly, we are humble. The Bible says, Humble yourselves, therefore, but before the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. We have a, there's a desire in you and in me who have been saved to be humble. Does that mean we're always humble? No, we desire to be. There's a desire in me to, to be humble. Let me read for you uh, James uh, chapter 4 and uh, verse number 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore... He saith, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. So we're talking about two systems here, or two ways of life. Ours is a way of holiness. That's why the world sometimes doesn't understand us and thinks that we're a bunch of hypocrites because no one can be, uh, no one's holy, uh, but we have a desire to be holy before God. We have a desire to walk with the Lord. We have a desire uh, to be separated unto him. Uh, in holiness. We have a desire to be humble. Uh, we're not trying to say, oh, you're, uh, we're right and everybody's wrong. No, we're saying this is the truth. Walk ye in it. There's a difference. 
So the believer has a desire for holiness. The believer has a desire for humility. And the believer has a desire for helpfulness. And it's just in you. It's in me. When, when you come to know Christ as your Savior, you have a desire to be a blessing. And it's just there. Uh, by the way, before I got saved, I didn't want to be a blessing to anyone but me. Uh, and that even includes my family. You know, really, I was at the top of the list. You say, well, didn't you love your kids? Oh, yeah. But I think it was me first. <clears throat> the Bible says in Ephesians again, in chapter 4 and verse uh, 28, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor. By the way, work is good. Let me say that again. Work is good. Amen. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing that is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. We have desire. We have a desire to work, but the motive of our work is different. We desire to be a blessing. We desire to be a help. We truly want to be a help. Are you following me tonight? But there's a system that, that's contrary to everything that I just said. It's the opposite. You say, well, uh, preacher, well, how do you know the difference? Well, this system is immoral. Notice uh, in Revelation uh, chapter 18 and, and uh, verse number 2 that we read. Let me get back there. Uh, <clears throat> And cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen and has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. <clears throat> it's, it's talking about this system, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this worldly system that people are buying into. It's immoral. It's wrong at its foundation. Uh, it's, it's, uh, if you... It, the deeper you get, the worse it gets. The uglier it gets, the more terrible it gets. It's the opposite of Christianity. The deeper you get, the more blessed it is. Amen. The sweeter it is, the purer it is. Amen. But this system's immoral. Secondly, notice verse number seven. How much ye have glorified. What's that next word? Herself. Herself. There's a pride about this system. All of us have to deal with pride. But we desire to be humble. There's a pride about this system. Uh, verse number seven. Let me read the whole verse. But how much more she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow uh, give her. For she hath saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no more a widow and shall see no more sorrow. Pride, lifted up in pride. That's that's the character of Satan himself. He's he's a uh, that's the destructive character that he has. Now I want, want you to know it's also selfish. Verse number thirteen. Uh, <clears throat> and and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and and wheat and beasts and horses and chariots and slaves and the souls of men. Selfish, using people, marketing people, even the souls of people. Whatever it takes for me to get ahead, that's what I've got to do. Whatever it takes to get to the top, that's the goal. Just get to the top. Just walk on anything. Walk on anybody. Just whatever it takes, just so I can get ahead. It's all about me. And by the way, this is the me generation. No wonder people aren't flocking to the church. We're telling people it's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ. That's what we heard this morning. But it, the amazing thing is when you find Christ, you find yourself. That's right. Amen. He that saveth his life shall lose it. It's not about you. Are you listening? It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Christ. But Christ is all about me and he's all about you. He makes us somebody. We're nobodies who are somebodies in Christ. Amen. Selfishness. It's awful. 
You listen to some people talk, you think, you think life rotated around them. And it certainly doesn't. So let me, let me put these things in contrast. Holiness. Immoral. The opposite. The system is immoral. Humble, proud. Helpful, selfish. It's the opposite. And Satan is the opposite of God. And that's what this system is built on, this, this Babylon. Now let's look at it a little more. In the first few verses we read here, the glory of heaven exposes Babylon. Uh, verse number one. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lighted with, with his glory. <clears throat> heaven exposes the wickedness uh, of Babylon. Pleasures and wealth have drawn people into this system. They still are. People are drawn into this system. Boy, if I could just get ahead, if I could just get this, if I could just get that, if I could just use this person, I'd be happy. If I could just use that person, I'd be happy. By the way, what's happening down at the border is awful. It's wicked. People are being merchandised on the southern border of the United States of America. They're being, they're being wickedly abused and and uh, uh, morally uh, molested and uh, turned, and some of them even uh, the slave trade is pro prospering in our southern border, and no one cares. That's what we're talking about tonight. God cares. Yeah. Amen. Notice with me in Second Timothy chapter three. The Bible says, verse number one, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. By the way, let me put this, this isn't put in there by mistake. Disobedient to parents. So that's not a big deal. It's a big deal. God gave you parents so that you could grow up right. You need to learn to obey them. Amen, preacher. Well, I'm just a teenager. We don't. Yes, you ought to. Honor your mom and dad. Well, they, no, don't make, don't give me any excuse. You honor your parents. Well, if I had perfect parents, well, maybe if they had perfect kids, they'd be better. disobedient to parents, unthankful. Wow. Isn't that where we're living? Unholy. Without natural affection. That's talking about immorality. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontent and fierce, despisers of those that are good. By the way, and we hang around here long enough. The Lord doesn't come pretty soon to the United States of America. We're going to find out the church in the United States we're going to be in a pickle. Because if you live a godly life, you're going to be the enemy of this wicked time, this wicked generation where everything is perverted, where good is evil spoken of, uh, where if you stand for what's right, you're wrong. Heaven exposes Babylon. I want you to notice in verses 4 through 8, and I heard another voice from heaven saying come out of her my people that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not her plagues for her sins have reached unto heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her double according to her works in the cup which she had filled fill it fill to her double how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much a torment and sorrow give her. Uh, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no more a widow and shall see no more sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall utterly be burned with fire. 
Uh, for strong is the Lord God who judges the earth. God says, come out of her, my people. You know, that's the message from the time of the fall through the church age and on into Revelation. There's a separation that needs to take place. We may, we may not like it, but there's a separation between evil, between wickedness, between wrong and right, and we need to be on the right side. We need to be there so that we stand a testimony for Jesus Christ. Our pastor spoke this morning about John the Baptist, and he did eat locusts and wild honey, and uh, he, he did dress differently than everybody else. But I'll tell you one thing. You read your Bible, he's one of the greatest men of God in the whole Bible. That's right. Amen. He was separated unto the Lord. He loved God. Uh, and I can't see how you could be too separated if you love God. Uh, we don't glory in our separation. We glory in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's right. But here, I want you to notice as a matter of fact, I know you all know, but keep your finger in Revelation and turn back to 2 Corinthians 6. This present generation has got the wrong idea of separation. I'm talking about generation of Christians. Separation is for our good. It's for God to bless us. It's for us to be a testimony. It's not that God's keeping something from you that you ought to have. Uh, notice here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Now I'm going to go all the way back to verse 14. I, I want to talk to you about verses 17 and 18. But it says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship, just asking the question, for what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? For what communion have light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Be who you are. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, and get saved. But if you profess Christ, be a child of God. Live that way. Live rightly. You're the temple of the living God. If God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, in other words, because of all these things, this just makes sense. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. But notice the promise here. And I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. Sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You see, God wants to bless our lives. Sometimes we're standing in the way. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. You're going to be mixed up. You need, to, you need to be all in. You need to give your life to Christ. You say, well, I'm not a preacher. You don't have, you don't have to be a preacher to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. You certainly don't want to... It, you, see, a lot of believers are trying to live in the world and in Christ. It doesn't work. And you end up being confused and your life gets messed up. And I want you to notice something before we go on there and back up to Revelation and notice verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Notice what it says there. That ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not her plagues. Have you ever noticed, and I have as a pastor especially, <clears throat> that people who are worldly in the church suffer the world's problems in their lives? Worldly people in the church, they may be saved, but they suffer things they shouldn't have to suffer because they don't walk with the Lord. 
Look, there's no better life than living with the one who is life. that you receive not her plagues. I'm not sure if I'm going to... My, my next point is... I don't know if you're getting the points, but you get the point. Uh, the first point is heaven exposes. The second point is warning. They're, they're not... To, uh, I don't have the same letter before everyone. I'm the, my, my third point... By the way, there's four. My third point is hopelessness. Hopelessness. You know, a Christian never has that. You never have hopelessness. I don't, I don't know what that's like anymore. But folks without the Lord, that's all they have. They live in fear and hopelessness. Perfect love casts out fear. Notice in verse 9, I'm not sure how much we'll read, we'll see. Time seems to move quickly. Most preachers know when you're preaching. Maybe not to, to you, but to me. Verse number 9 in Revelation 8, 18. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and have lived deliciously with her shall, be, shall wail and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning standing afar off for fear of her torment saying alas alas that great city Babylon that mighty city for in one hour is judgment come and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen, purple and silk, scarlet, and all fine wood, and all manner of vessels of ivory, and all manner of vessels most precious wood and brass, and iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and the beast and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and the souls of men. And the fruits that they, that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all the things which, which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for fear and torment and weeping and wailing and saying alas alas the great city that was clothed with fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls for in one hour so great riches has come to naught and every shipmaster and all the company of ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea afar off, and cried when they saw the smoke of burning, saying, What city is like the great city? <clears throat> and they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, Alas, alas, the great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea, and by reason of uh, her costliness, for in one hour she is made desolate. I, I just want to want to try to I want to try to get you to see the instantaneous destruction of Babylon and how easily things could happen. Have you ever thought about suppose the power grid of the United States? I'm just using the United States went out. There was no more power. Say, so, well, that couldn't happen. Yes, it could. And suppose there's no more power. Well, preacher, I've got a generator. Uh, how much fuel you got there, bud? It's not going to last long. Well, I've got a deep freeze, nothing to run it. Uh, what's going to happen to our water? Where are you going to get water? But see, I, 
people have gotten so ridiculously unintelligent that they think that meat comes from a grocery store. You say, I don't believe that. I, I'm telling you the truth. Uh, I read something this past week. I'm, I believe it was true because I've seen people like this that they said, uh, you hunters ought to be ashamed of yourself going out. You need to go to the grocery store and get your meat. Where do you think it comes from? <laughs> you say, people aren't that dumb. Yes, they are. And they've grown up with everything they want, when they want it, how they want it. You don't have... You will say, oh, I'll just get in my car. Your car's got a computer chip in it. I don't think your car's gonna run. Well, I'll just get on my phone. <clears throat> Last time I went north, which was recently, I thought, man, what if something happened and everything did crash? I'm not trying to give you fear. I'm trying to say how, how sensitive the structure of our world is now yep that it, it is it would be so easy to collapse the whole thing I, I don't live in fear I'm not telling you that to make you afraid I'm just telling you when these things begin to happen people are going to go oh no oh no the system fell apart all my money was in the stock market all my money was in the bank the, you say why well, put mine in the bank I, I didn't put it in the stock market well it's in the bank guess what the bank runs electronically you don't have any money well, I'll tell you what, I have foxed them. I've got mine in silver and gold. Won't buy a pound of nothing. Who wants silver and gold? You're going to want food. And the person that has the food isn't going to want the silver and gold. You can't eat that. What I'm telling you is this is just the way it is. You say, well, you're just... You're just fear-mongering. No, I'm not. I don't want people to be afraid. I'm just telling you that if you think you're standing on anything but Jesus Christ, you're standing on the wrong spot. Right. Our confidence, we are, we are not hopeful in anything in this world but Jesus Christ. Right. Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. It's only Christ. Amen. If you don't have him, you don't have anything. You have no place to stand. If you read in Revelation chapter 20, and we'll be there when the, when the great white throne judgment comes and all men fled away and there wasn't any place for them to stand. There was nothing for them to stand on because they didn't have Christ. Read the foundation there and the parable that Christ gave about the man that built upon the sand. Here it is. It's the ultimate he built upon the sand and the rains came, the flood came and washed it all away because it wasn't built on the foundation of God. Where are you building your life? They invested their lives. Sadly, this... You know, what, what's happening at our southern border? And I, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just telling you, it exposes us. That we would, that we would, you think, well, these people, they're coming to our country because they don't have anything. Have you ever been in any, any of these Central American countries? They can make a living on their farms. But they're under the illusion that if they get here, there's a free lunch and everything's wonderful. And they get into gangs and crimes and all kinds of things. You got you got to live right here just like you need to live right anywhere else. You got to work here just like you need to work anywhere else. Several years ago, we brought a, a couple into the country. Brother Brother Charlie went. They took a mission trip to Germany, and they brought. They came back, and and a couple wanted to come to the United States because they were fleeing their country. They were fleeing Iran because they didn't live. Uh, the way the Iranians lived and their lives were, and so they had to flee. They fled to Germany, and then they then they came to America. Well, they lived with us for a couple months, but they had the wrong idea of America. They believed that when they got here, they were, and the the man of the household believed he had to work, but the woman thought that she should get a a three bedroom ranch with some land, and everything should be paid for. You say people don't believe that. That's what they think. If I just get over the border, everything's going to be wonderful. And, and 
and these drug dealers and cartels are using things to 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 entice people so they can use them and I, I'm gonna be very direct so they can sell them that's what's happening and we we have political people in this country that are that are doing this so they can get votes that's awful that's awful the souls of men that's what it says right here we're selling people that's the system say well that doesn't happen yes it does America's not what she was unless we have revival she will never be again I love my children my grandchildren I want them to see the America I grew up in it was still still had her problems but it was a lot more righteous than it is today Amen. a lot of things have come out of the closet that we wish it go back in People are viewed because of the false teaching of, of evolution as animals. That's right. We're not animals. Right. We have souls. Let me move on. My time's uh, leaving. I want you, want, to, want you to know it's the last point. First, uh, rejoicing of heaven. This, this sounds strange, the rejoicing of heaven. Why would heaven rejoice at this judgment? Because these things have to these things have to be, have to go they can't continue why did god why did god scatter the original babylon because it had to be dealt with and god's judgment falls upon this wicked kind of living this false system this false political system this false this material system this system that exalts man and man is Man knows everything. There is no Green New Deal. What a bunch of false science. You say, well, you, no, don't tell me about it. The earth is going to burn up one day, but God is going to burn it up. And, uh, I'm sorry. The rejoicing of heaven, verse 20. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. See? It's killed the prophets and the apostles of the past. How did the apostle Paul die? Caesar's, we believe Caesar's action. Verse 21, and a mighty angel stood up, and a mighty angel took up a stone like a giant millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, thus <clears throat> with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And that's my title this evening, no more at all. See, if you're invested in this thing, no more at all. It has an end. Invest your life in Christ. Lay up your treasures in heaven. We'll neither moth nor rust or corrupt nor thieves break through and steal. Verse 22. And the voice of the harpers and the musicians and the pipers and the trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman, whatsoever craft he be, shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of the millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee and the merchants and the great men of the earth for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived and in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth you see this evil is going to come to a close if you think about it let me let me put it together like this why did Pilate why did he why did, why did he allow Christ to be crucified because it was it, for him it was politically popular and he made the choice to reject Christ it was politically popular that's the kind of choices a lot of people are making today why did Judas sell Christ for 30 pieces of silver gain 
game. Why did the, the religious lost of that day, which we would kind of identify for the most part as the scribes and Pharisees, why, why, did, they, why did they orchestrate the death of Jesus Christ? And when, when they said, I'll, I'll give you Barabbas, give us Christ, we want to crucify him. Why did they do that? Why? why? They did it for power. See, things haven't changed much. This is a system that destroys the souls of men and women and boys and girls. That's why we need to get the gospel out. We believe in Jesus Christ. In closing, I want us to turn uh, to 1 John chapter 2. Everybody still with me? Okay. This is one of those messages that's got so much in it, I hope I don't lose everybody. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But, well, that's an important word in the Bible. But, he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I want to be in that group. I want to be in that group. I'm enlisted in the Lord's army. I want to be in that group. I want you to notice the, uh, the parallel, holy and moral. It doesn't make any difference how I live, preacher. Oh, yes, it does. If you're saved, you want to live for God. You may fail, but you want to live for God. Amen? Amen. Humble or proud? Well, tell me what to do. I'll do what I want. You're in the wrong crowd. You may be going to hell. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Amen. You need to be in the right crowd. Amen. Helpful or selfish. It's a system that, that people gravitate to because of their desires. But when you start building a life upon Jesus Christ, you see it's a false system. You see, it's a deceptive system. It doesn't deliver. Only God can give you peace that passes all understanding. Only God can give you a hope, not a hope so, but a hope that one day you'll stand with him and your loved ones in heaven. I'm anticipating heaven. I can't wait to see some folks. I can't wait. I, you know, I, I'm probably going to walk up there and Pastor Bullock's going to be there and he's going to stick his hand out and I'm going to say, how are you doing? Preacher, he's going to say better. And for the first time, he'll mean it. <laughs> I, I, I'm looking forward to heaven. You say, you say, well, if if I die and y'all are here and they have my funeral down here, uh, you just say that he's finally made it, and uh, I'll be home. Don't you worry about me. I'll be home. Well, take care of my wife, but don't you worry about me. I'll be with the Lord. Where's that come from? That's not pride. Jesus saved me. And if you don't know him, I want you to know him. The system's fake. It doesn't work. It doesn't deliver. It destroys families. It destroys lives. It ruins people. But not Christ. He gives you life. He gives you hope. He gives you peace. He orders your life in such a way that you can truly be happy and truly have joy. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, what a blessing is the Word of God. And how we are grateful that in your grace you've delivered us from this life which is so vain and so hurtful and so ugly. You've given us opportunity to love and to walk with you, to be a testimony for you. And Lord, may we be that testimony we desire to be. There's someone here tonight that's not sure of their eternal destiny.
or maybe someone that's not living for you. Lord, may they come tonight and do business with you. Thank you for the word of God in this portion of scripture. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. Now if the Lord spoke to you.